so much content out there, how do you filter through all the noise and catch straight to the value? What has become very apparent is that the best way to learn is to surround yourself with those you aspire to be. But you can't just watch what they do. At some point you have to turn it into an action. Knowledge isn't power. Applied knowledge is power. On this podcast, you will go on a journey as we speak to people who are making the difference in their industries and people who, if you listen too closely and take action, can turn you into who you want to be. My name is Mark Sclair, and this is the Building a Successful Career podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Failing My Way in Public to Success, the Mark Sclair podcast. As you know, I focus on two key parts to this. One is me documenting my journey and speaking about the failures that I have along the way. And the other part is bringing people onto the show that we can ask questions to and get a real insight about what it takes to overcome challenges, build networks, have people, have people support you, have people champion you, and rise up those ranks and be the success that you've always wanted to be. Now, on the show today, I have a very special guest. Um, it goes by the name of Jeremy Ryan Slater. Oh, nice to see you, Jeremy. Hey, thanks for having me today, man. I only use my middle name because my parents named me after a really bad cowboy actor. So like I couldn't get found in Google for like years. Um, I am not a huge egotistical jerk because I also insist on using my middle name. (laughs) There we go. And there's a tip if you want to, if if you're not getting any rankings or any searches on Google, work out something that would stand out a little bit different. (laughs) Yeah. Great. So... Jeremy, um, you're on the show today, and there's a question I like to ask to people because, and I'll give you a bit of background to this. There's two words, and it's imposter syndrome. And some people see it as a positive, some people see it as a negative. I'd just like to get what your thoughts are on it, and then we'll go into a bit of detail after my, my, my opinion on it. So my, my viewpoint on that's changed over the years, and, and this is why I'll, why I'll tell you that. Um, you know, like for me initially, um, you know, I'm kind of feeling like I don't deserve to be in this room. I, you know, don't have the credentials to be here. Um, and I struggled a lot with that, frankly, because, you know, I was going to be an educator. That's what I wanted to do. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, I'm in the, the online marketing world, I'm in the PR world. I'm like doing all these things. I'm running a company that's growing. Um, I'm hiring some people that are more qualified to be in their job than me. Um, and I, and I will tell you one of the biggest things that I realized, um, is imposter syndrome, if you use it the right way, it's kind of a check, if that makes sense. It's a check on you and what you're doing. Because I think at the same time, um, if you get too big on your own ego, you know, if you get too big on how cool you are, um, you don't look at a lot of the, the different aspects of things you need to consider and things like that. So I think at the same time, um, initially, I think it held me back in some ways because I, I didn't realize my own competence and my own ability in certain things. But I think now, as I've realized that, you know, my own competence and ability and things like that, um, it's kind of been a check on, you know, checking my ego um, and, and kind of making sure I'm still listening, I'm still learning, I'm still progressing. So I think at the same time, um, it's not something that really ever goes away, but you learn how to kind of channel it properly. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with you really. Like, and the reason why I say this, I, I was listening to a podcast the other week so many great podcasts out there so many great shows sure. so just you know just take some time in and there's, there's a guy called uh, Stephen Bartlett the diary of the CEO um he's over in America at the moment actually but he's he interviews people and there was a guy called Jimmy Carr who is a comedian on there or comedian in the UK and he spoke about he went to Cambridge University and he said he had no right to be there no right at all the guy was dyslexic He would just struggled with so many things, but he said imposter syndrome was the most important thing that happened to him because, because he didn't think he should be there. He Mm -hmm. couldn't get complacent and he had to work 10 times harder than everybody else. So I think if we can channel that, that negativity of, I can't do this, I'm not worthy and turn it into Mm -hmm. if I work so hard, I'll be able to get to where I want to be. Mm-hmm. with working hard and no one else be able to work as hard as me, then I, I can get there. That's an excellent point because um, I, I have a, a book coming out um, on June 21st called Unremarkable to Extraordinary. And one of the things that I've talked about, and it's not through the eyes of imposter syndrome, but it lines up exactly what you're saying is like the concept of adversity and, and how we use it. 
Um, are, are you familiar with like American football at all? Um, cause I know, you know, Go for it. European, yes. European football and there's American football. Um, so, so in America, um, Tom Brady, uh, is, it was the quarterback for the new England Patriots. Mm. And, you know, now is the quarterback for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He's 45 years old and still playing, which is incredible. And one of the things that, that we, I look at in Tom Brady, um, is in his high school, he barely started his senior year. Um, he got to college and he was this highly touted, you know, five-star recruit was going to be a great player his freshman year. Then the coach leaves and the athletic director leaves. And all of a sudden he's not the starter. And he ends up not until his senior year of being the starter, but then he had to even compete to start. And he only got to start half the games. Gets drafted in the sixth round uh, by the New England Patriots. They carry four quarterbacks, which teams don't typically do because they liked him. He may be good. He may not be good. Then the number one quarterback gets hurt. Tom Brady plays and he never gives up that spot again. And that goes into what you're saying is Tom Brady always worked harder. Mm-hmm. Always studied more. Always did all those different things because he didn't have the biggest arm. He's slow as hell. So yeah. he was able to kind of take a look at all these different things and say, okay, well, I can outwork somebody. I can outthink somebody. He knew the playbook backwards and forwards. Mm-hmm. And when you do things like that, because you say, okay, well, I don't have a right to be here, but I'm going to show them why I do have a right to be here. I think at the same time, there's a lot you can do with that. Yeah. The, the Tom Brady one's a great example because all the statistics, all of the measurements that you look at for, for a quarterback, he literally, none of them he fitted in. And they literally had to create a whole new statistics because of him, because he's been so yeah. successful and they've had to look at different players because of that. Well, and it's, it's one of those things, I think um, this goes in, into business, it goes into life, it goes into everything else. Mm-hmm. There's certain things that you can't statisize, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how somebody leads a group of people, how somebody makes other people better. There's people that have that and there's other people that don't. And I think that goes right back to the idea of imposter syndrome, because you're able to check yourself. You're able to say, okay, this is what I'm good at. This is what I'm not good at. And when you're able to do that, because you're being honest with yourself, where a lot of people can't, right? You know, somebody that's a, a, a first round draft pick or kind of the best at what they do, they may not understand their true weaknesses. And because of that, they're going to fail others. So I think it actually is, it's self-awareness in some ways. Yeah. And I just want to touch on something that you, you yeah. did and you did really, really well. And it's something which I speak about so much within sales and it's in regards to uh, telling stories. And what you did was you took the Tom Brady story and you related it to the scenario of imposter syndrome. And I just don't think that that is used enough. And there's so many different techniques. And I I like in your book, uh, which Mm -hmm. is coming out on June the 21st, as you mentioned, is that uh, you use like extraordinary stories within there. And I think it's Mm -hmm. a great way for somebody and, it, and you got to know the audience. And I think that's why you asked me if I know yeah. NFL because- uh, luckily, Well, yeah, because yeah. like if the, if the story isn't gonna make sense, you're not gonna waste your time, man. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's it, that's it. The, the good thing is I used to go to America every year when I was younger. So um, I always had some interest. My my team was the Raiders though. That was my team. Okay. Yeah, well, they've been, the team. NFL started doing some games once a year now they're, where they're coming out to London and playing, which has been kind of interesting. So I, yeah. I don't know how that'll take because I know like, um, you know, European football is, is, you know, still King, um, and probably will still be King. Uh, so I, I don't know, man, I, I, st- I studied, uh, in, in, uh, at Oxford for, for a bit. So like, I, I kind of understand culturally a little bit, uh, I guess better than most Americans would, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> interesting to see American football, but it's, I don't see it catching on. Like, you know, soccer's crazy, man. It's interesting though, because America has such an influence all around the world. Even, and it makes me laugh because there's countries that will say they're, you know, without getting too political, they say they're anti-American, but yeah. they've got all the brands there and they speak with the American accent and they've been schooled in America. And it's, uh, there's such influence. We've been, I've, I've grown up around it. I, I mean, I, yeah. I live in the UAE in Dubai. So, but before moving here 14 years ago, if I, I always thought I'd grow up and live in America, actually, that's always thought mm. I'd end up. Um, but there's such a blend with it being westernized and, and so Americanized over in the UAE that it's like I'm here. It's like I'm in America anyway. So um, I don't know, I man. Sometimes as, I think sometimes as Americans, we could relax a little bit. There's some really <laughs> freaking cool cultures around the world that I don't think we, you know, kind of um, I don't know the right term, but grant enough like, you know, respect and levity to as well. I think we could do a little bit of a better job with that. But, you know, I, I do agree with you. Like the culture is definitely global. 
It's just interesting, you know, there's a, a statistic, I don't know what the number is now, but there's a higher percentage yeah. of Americans that don't have a passport. And it's, me, it's kind of shocking, actually. I, yeah. it, until I was 21, I, I didn't have one. So like, um, but now I've been to like 20 something countries at, at this point in my life. And I do think travel and, and understanding other cultures is something like it, it's a really enriching your life and it helps you to communicate better. It helps you to understand where somebody's coming from better. Like, um, yeah. I just think like if you're missing out on that, man, you're missing out in life sometimes. But if you live in, in New York, for example, and you fancy a weekend away and you can go to L.A. and you don't need a passport, <laughs> it's not a bad place to end up. <laughs> I, I live in the, I live in the country, man. We have two yeah. dozen chickens. I have a pig. We have farm animals. I don't know who'd want to live in New York or L.A., man. It's just no. too much for me. <laughs> <Fair> <laughs> enough. <laughs> but I'm just saying from one side of the country to the other, it's just a yeah. completely different experience that you can have. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, amazing. Definitely. Yeah. So, so getting back to this, uh, the story. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, man. I pulled, I pulled you off topic there. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. No worries. <laughs> um, in, in regard to these stories and the way yeah. that we can tell stories to people. And as I mentioned mm-hmm. in the book, you've, you've touched on a lot of the times giving examples of different stories of people. Um, mm-hmm. Why, why have you done that? And why is it so important to tell stories to people? Well, I, I think that really, that really goes in anything, right? Like, um, if I started sat here and just started rattling off stats to you, um, you may log off the Zoom call, you may get mm-hmm. bored, you may fall asleep. Like stories are the single most human thing we've ever had, right? They've been passed down for generations, even before they were written down. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what it really comes down to, whether it's in a sales conversation or whether it's in, um, you know, your marketing, you have to focus on like, number one, who is this for, right? Because like I asked you, like, do you get American football? Yeah. Like. If I tell that story and you don't get American football, you're going to be bored as hell. Yeah. Um, but like at the same time, like it's understanding who this is to and how the story helps them because stories, they show transformation in the way that statistics and other things just can't, right? Like those things are based in fact, and that's great. Um, mm-hmm. But stories, they help people to kind of take that viewpoint and put themselves in that, um, in anything in your life. That's, that's why like for me, you know, whether I'm on a podcast or whether I'm writing or whether I'm speaking on a stage, I'm always trying to see like, how can I help a story relate to people? Because that's, it's what makes it more real to them. It's a reality point. Exactly. It becomes relatable. And as long as you understand who that person is in front of you. Um, and it's interesting. I was telling a story about my niece who my brother bought a bicycle for, and she was upset because she wanted this bicycle and my brother went to the store and it was so expensive and he ended up buying a cheaper version. And Uh-oh. Yeah, exactly. So he, took, he takes his cheaper version home and she starts cycling with it and she falls off the bike and she grazes her knee and she's crying her eyes out. She's so emotional. And when I told this story in a sales training, to, it was actually to, to show the difference between like price and cost. It's better to spend the money initially than it ends up costing more in the long run. But what I didn't realize was somebody literally said to me, don't, I don't care about the price. How is your niece? How is she? You know, and it was, they were so upset by what had actually gone on. And I was telling the story and I was trying to kind of be sympathetic to what had gone on. But the, the, the main aim was price versus cost. And yeah. they really were drawn into like, how is your niece? And it's, uh, it's interesting. You've got a great story and it can change from different person to different person. And I think that's also a vital lesson to understand as well, because there's some people like, well, how much can I save? Or, you know, what is it going to do? And it's like, well, if you're losing time or if you're buying it twice because it broke or whatever, then it's kind of like, what's the point and what's the other cost? But, and I think that story perfectly portrays that because you get that right away. And that just goes back to the power of story. Yeah, exactly. Great. Okay. So um, in, in the book, um, there was a word that stood out to me in one of the chapters or a phrase oh. that stood out to me. <laughs> it wasn't a misspelling. Don't worry about that. Um, it was the word passion. Okay, and you put a quote up by Mark Cuban, and it is, if anyone tells you that you just need passion, and that's the advice you've been given or been getting, it couldn't be further from the truth, just to kind of round that up. And you say you need more than passion to be able to be successful, but it kind of goes against what everyone's told, that if you've got the passion, you can do whatever you want. So, John, mm-hmm. kind of tell me a little bit more about why. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the key reasons I wrote the book, frankly, because I think that there's all these people out there giving advice to follow your passion and, 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 
And um, the, the, the kind of differentiation I want to make is there's two ways to look at it. There's follow your passion and find your passion. And follow your passion is an effect process, right? It's something that happens to you because you're following something and hope it's going to happen to you. Find your passion is an active process. It's a cause viewpoint. And that's something you're actually able to do. Um, I had to do a lot of things I didn't like in order to mm. find my passion, right? So I think too many times people are just kind of sitting there and they're, they're waiting for life to happen to them rather than figure out what they're going to do with life. So rather than saying passion is bad, it's not bad. It's good to be passionate about what you do so you actually enjoy it. But I think the viewpoint on it is when you're looking at life, you want to, in order to find your passion, you're going to have to do a lot of things you don't like. Um, you know, I did network marketing. I sold life insurance. I did online marketing. I went to China, bought products, private labeled them and sold them on the internet. I had to do a lot of things I didn't like to do um, in order to find what I like to do. And I think that's part of the problem. There's like a kind of a big thing missing. Um, and this is actually a conversation I was just having with my wife, like 10 minutes before you and I got on here. So this is a really, really relevant. Um, but you look at like, you know, education, right? At, at 17 or 18 years old, you're making the decision to go to college and do what you're going to do the rest of your life at 17, and 18 years old. I don't know about you. Um, but at 17 years old, I wanted to be in a rock and roll band. Um, I am not in a rock and roll band. You know what I mean? Like you don't have the life experience. You don't have a lot of these different things to make that decision. Education is good, but also it's, it's, in, it's good when it's relevant. And one of the biggest things missing is the idea of apprenticeships. You work under somebody that has that ability or has that talent or has been doing that. And you either get experience or you just, you get discernment. You find out you don't like it. So I think that's, what's really, really important is, you're going to have to do some things you don't like. It's okay. If you don't like them, you can move on. Failure isn't bad. But I think at the same time, the idea of like letting life happen to you and following your passion, you know, you, you find something you're good at and continue to get better and better and better at it. Um, you're going to get pretty darn passionate about it when you figure out how to do something with it. So it's about finding your passion, not following it. No, that's great. That's great. I mean, it's what I wanted to be when I was younger was actually a lawyer. And uh, oh, oh yeah wow well, you were you were much more much more tied up than i was man wanting to be a barrister like i i uh i uh i i've played drums since i was like 12 so i thought i was going to be in a rock and roll band that would have been cool as well did you grow your hair extra long or oh i had hair down to my shoulders man oh, okay yeah you're doing the rock, the rock oh yeah, yeah 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 i thought i was john bonham man <laughs> yeah nice nice well i i wanted to be a lawyer okay and i lived with this this problem that I wanted to be this lawyer, um, mm -hmm. but it wasn't working because I couldn't study, I couldn't revise. And, and later on in life, I've realized that I'm, I'm not the best at focusing on stuff. And there's things that I've learned to adapt to that now. And I wish I knew that back then. But sure. the idea of being a lawyer was, was something that I really wanted to do. And I kept on pushing, kept on trying to do it. And one of the, thing, one of the key parts to being a lawyer is helping people someone's in trouble someone's got a problem you're there to solve it you, your expertise can be put across to somebody and you can do great things with that now i've ended up in sales and i've been in sales the past 20 years okay and from what i've just said i always ask a question in my training like what is the job of a salesperson well Help people but not just that it's to be a problem solver that's the main yeah. thing someone's got a problem if you can solve it you're of value to them. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between being a lawyer and being a salesperson? Everyone's in sales, okay? But the big problem was I couldn't live with the, the, the thought of somebody just seeing me as a salesperson. You know, the... the well, I think because society yeah. kind of has a bad viewpoint on sales and they have a bad exactly. connotation on sales. Yeah. Whereas a good salesperson should, you know, care about you, care about mm -hmm. what you need, um, and not care about their own commission. And because of that they're solving your problem, that goes right back to what you're saying. Yeah. And what I realized was there's a difference between a salesperson and a sales professional. So yes. every day I work on myself to develop myself, to make myself better, be that industry expert, be that person that people go to. And you mentioned this uh, within your book as well in regards to being that authority expert. Some people want to come to you because you're that expert in the market. And if you want to touch on that a little bit more to explain, like, why is that so valuable? Well, it's so valuable because you're not competing, right? And I think so often everybody's 
competing with others real, then, rather than realizing, okay, how am I different? How am I helping others and how can I stand out? And at the same time, taking responsibility for that. Mm-hmm. What I mean is so many people depend on others to tell their story and then they wonder why their story doesn't get out. You have to take responsibility for getting that out. And that is how you become more of an expert, right? There's a lot of people that are incredible at the things they do, but they keep their mouth shut and they don't promote and they don't do these things. And you have to be willing to, to get out there because that is the only way you help more people is by promoting and telling your story in the right way. And I think you have to realize it's a very, you, you know, you want to be cause rather than effect, right? You want things to happen because of you, not to you. Yeah. And I think that's how you have to look at being an authority is you could be really great at something. But if you're not willing to promote yourself, you're not willing to tell your own story and you're not you're, you're not willing for uh, taking responsibility to get out there, you're not ever going to be an authority. And when you become an authority, the difference is as well is people come to you. They come to you and they ask you questions rather than saying, well, convince me on why I should work with you because they're already convinced. They just want to see how you would help them particularly. And I think when you're even tying that into to sales, as we've kind of been talking about here, is when you set yourself as up as an authority as a salesperson, person's pretty much decided they want to work with you. They just want to, they just want to hear how you're going to help them in particular and you can solve their problem, which kind of goes back to what we've been talking about here. So that really, to me, is why authority matters because it changes the conversations you have and mm. it's changing how you're talking to prospects. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because if we look at the way my podcast is, which is documenting my journey and explaining my failures as well, it kind of conflicts with this idea that you're this expert and my, my friend would be like, you can't tell people that you've made this mistake or you've had this failure or this has gone wrong in your life. And I said, I think people can relate more to that because they realize actually that if he's made this mistake and he's actually been able to get on with things and, and do great things, then why can't I do that? And I think- Well, you become untouchable otherwise, right? Mm-hmm. Like people, like if, if you're kind of like this person on a pedestal doesn't make mistakes, you're not a human being. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting. I call it, it's, it's funny you say that. It's, it's like the eight mile comeback. Yeah. It's like, I've said everything you can say about me. You've got nothing to say back. And they just choke. Yeah. You know, it's, it's Eminem yeah. eight mile, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> went, yeah. You're talking, you're talking about the battle scene that when, yeah, when, when he, he, went he, to he, he just kind of drops the mic school. and it's over. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm putting it all out there. Like nobody. Yeah. Nobody can talk more crap about what I've been through on a daily basis than what I do in, in that segment of my podcast. Now, now the big thing is, are millions of people listening to it? Well, not yet. When they do, they'll be able to go back but to... It, it, it also doesn't have to be millions of people. I think that's a huge misconception as well. Like, if you're getting your message out to the right people that then they affect other people mm. like that's that's what it's like man it's ripples in a pond like i think there's a total misconception it has to be millions of people well that's it i hear these little gems i come into the office and i share a little thing that i learned and it's just this this like you said the ripple effect so it just knocks on mm. and it's interesting how people take different things on and that's why i like to bring up something and see how everybody else feels about it because they can all have different opinions from what's been said. They may have got offended by it. I might have got offended by it. They may have taken it very well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, absolutely. What's happening here? Sorry. Um, so when we're talking about podcasts, um, you've mentioned in regards to how to how to take something from the billion dollar industry that is this podcast world. And I think so many people are literally signing up to these podcasts or starting a podcast. And like you said, like they're expecting millions of followers and it's just not happening straight away. So people obviously yeah. need to stay consistent, stay with it, uh, which is what I try to do. But what are some of the things that you see people doing as mistakes that you think could be quick fixes or something that they can work on to, to get better at? Well, I'm going to refer this to the wisdom of Eric Cartman. Um, there was a podcast, there was an episode of South Park, I think in like 2007. It was like when, when YouTube was first getting popular. And it was so funny because uh, Cartman and, and all these guys are like, they're trying to do like crazy stuff to like get on YouTube because they had watched all these people and they had thought, if you just get on YouTube, like you're going to make millions of dollars and it's going to be all this. And they were going to make something called the magical internet money. And I think it's the same misconception people have around podcasts, right? 
they think they're going to get out there. Um, it's just a matter of time to their Joe Rogan. And they're making all these millions of dollars in advertising. Um, and I'm going to be honest with you, it's less than 1% of people that are going to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's understanding and having the right conception of a podcast is it's something that helps people to know you, like you, and trust you and promotes a business you already have, right? Like, I think that's another important thing as well. Like people do business with you because they know you, like you, and trust you, which is what a podcast used correctly helps you to do. Mm -hmm. I think at the same time, it's also about differentiating how you have your conversations. Um, there are so many people out there doing the exact same podcast format, right? Like, you know, here we're having an incredible conversation. I've really enjoyed a lot of the directions we went in that. this. There's a lot of people that are overly scripted and they don't do that. And because of that, they're not able to build audience. They're not able to make it real to people. They're not able to tell stories. So you have to realize, like, how am I different? And how am I, how am I going to hammer that in? If you can do that, then you should start a podcast. If you can't figure that out, you might want to wait a little bit. And I would also say at the same time, it's realizing, am I going to be doing this for six months to a year without really seeing an effect? You have to be willing to do that. I think a lot of people kind of jump ship way too early to even get established, get their own story right, get their own message right. It's going to be a little bit before you're comfortable with that. I hated the sound of my voice on microphone for two years before I started a podcast, you know, when I started my podcast. So at the same time, like you have to be willing to be in it for the long run. You have to understand how this fits in your business and understand what the, what the value is in somebody knowing you, liking you, and trusting you. Yeah, some great points. And you, you touch on it um, in regards to this blueprint. So do you want to speak a bit more about that, about the blueprint of, of having a successful podcast? Well, to me, it's, you know, what we've been kind of talking about here. It's being yeah. different. It's having your own, you know, your own kind of viewpoints on things. But at the same time, interviewing people within your niche that have have established brands and have pull mm -hmm. because there, there's a concept in, in the branding world called positioning. And there's a great book out there. If your audience hasn't read it, it was written in the seventies uh, by Jack Trout and Al Reese. It's called positioning the battle for your mind, but okay. positioning is what you're seen for or against uh, the one I hate the most, but it's used most commonly. So people understand it is we're the Uber of blank. Um, <laughs> people understand what Uber is. So they understand how you relate to it. So you're taking something people are already familiar with and you're grabbing that positioning in your mind. And when you're having a podcast, interviewing other people that are authorities in your space helps you to do that, right? Because each time you're seen with those, with those people, you're, gather, you're, you're grabbing some of their authority. So that's giving you positioning, right? You're seen with this guest. You're seen against this guest, whatever it may be. So to me, that's the real value in, in what you can do with a podcast is know you, like you, and trust you, but also build authority because you're borrowing positioning of others. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. But how... How do we get these people on the podcast? Because that's what people say. I want to interview people. I want to get people on. But yeah. I, need pe I need big people because nobody's going to listen to me otherwise. So how, so how, how can we That's a misconception. That? I'll say that's a misconception. Like people don't need to, you don't need to have big people. Like it definitely helps your positioning. But you don't have to have big people because in 2015, those big people would share your episode. Now mm -hmm. they don't. So it's not going to help you get traffic. Um, and, and, and that's one part of it, but I think the other part about it is realizing your own unique viewpoint is really valuable. Um, but going into that positioning and how you get those people, how you reach out is really, really important. I think too many people make it about numbers. Um, we have great numbers. I don't pitch for about numbers when I'm reaching out to guests. I talk about the purpose of what I'm doing, why it matters that I talk to them and why, you know, that kind of matters for this, this whole conversation we're going to have. And I also talk about in particular, the things I want to discuss in that conversation. If you're vague with what you want to talk about, you're not going to get somebody to agree. And it's also understanding the right way to reach out to somebody. There's two tools that I've used that have been really, really impactful. One is called uh, contactanycelebrity.com, which has been great for getting contact information. Also, uh, IMDB Pro or Internet Movie Database Pro. Um, if anybody's ever been in a movie, even as a cameo, you can find out who the representation is. Um, I've also had some success on social media as my social media accounts have grown since um, I don't have it on Instagram yet, but I have a blue check mark on Facebook and Twitter. And that's also helped me and reach out to some of these people as well, because it's helped my authority. Um, so to me, if you can focus on purpose, if you can focus on talking to the right person and how you want to have that conversation, you're going to be pretty successful. Yeah, it's, it's some great points. And I think, get, I think as well, get those interviews in early, like with, cause I've, I've actually got some quite successful school friends. So I'm always looking for like these big celebrities and these big people, but I've actually got some friends which I'm so proud of because we've come from yeah. the same, we've come from the same school, the same 
We've, I mean, one of them was specifically told by the headmaster, you will never amount to anything ever in your life. And the guy was on Dragon's Den uh, the other week, actually, uh, which mm-hmm. is the UK version of Shark Tank in America. And he yeah. ended up pitching to the guys and he started a business during COVID time and he got the backing from two of, two of the dragons, which are the sharks. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's just so hilarious because I'm he's going to be on my podcast soon. And I literally want to say to him, like, I saw that our old headmaster commented on one of the videos that sent, oh, congratulations. You know, I know the headmaster will say, hey, I, I gave you, I said this to you because I knew you needed that push. Yeah, <laughs> but... It's just I'm just interested to hear what he's going to say about all of that because yeah it's like getting people in learning how to interview learning how to speak to people communicate with people and putting mm-hmm. those hours in the practice in you know the, the ten thousand hours as they say. I think that's a little bit too arbitrary sometimes. Like you know it does it does mean that like you're going to have to spend a lot of time to do something, but yeah. there's nothing that says you can't get really good at something in five thousand. But there's yeah. also nothing that says you can't get good at something in 20,000. So I think I think at the same time, uh, 10,000, like I've, I've read the book and I, and I think it's interesting and I'm, I'm interested in Malcolm Gladwell's content. But I think 10,000 yeah. hours is a little too arbitrary. Um, just put in the work, you know. You know what it is, though? I think everyone needs to hear a number or an end date or something like yeah, a target I guess so. at the end, you know, and they probably thought 10,000 was enough. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they averaged it out. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, talking of people that have been on 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 podcasts, um, mm-hmm. I noticed that it was one person who who's been on yours, which I'm very much an admirer of, and he actually got me started with a one year challenge that I did, which was I ended up oh, wow. doing for one year um, weekdays. I put out a one minute video sales tip, and I literally started out with "Hi, this is Mark, and this is sales values tips first and and in the end, like, because I've always been uncomfortable with speaking to people, but all of a sudden I had to be on camera. Yeah. And it's, as, you, as I'm sure you're aware, it's completely different. So that yeah. just got me so comfortable with it. Uh, but I was doing a 30-day challenge with Russell Brunson for ClickFunnels. Mm. Yeah. And um, I just think, you know, tell, tell me what you think about him. I, I think I so he's really key on education. And I think the entrepreneurs that matter really, really, you know, do that. Like if you read his books, he gives away everything, which I think is something that's really, really important. I think too many people come from a place of scarcity and being mm-hmm. concerned that other people are going to get their content. And I think Russell's really good at that. So if you want to be effective, be willing to educate because a better educated public is actually a better educated prospect. So that's that's kind of my viewpoint on Russell. Well, it's interesting because I, I tell you how I came around about Russell. I attended an event two years ago, just before COVID, and it was Les Brown. Brown. I typed in 90 and, minutes. Uh, you know, I've always wanted to meet Les Brown. Thank God I had a chance no, to. He also spoke Russell to Brunson. Brunson comes up. Absolutely incredible. With his Grant Cardone. But during that time, there was the event. And company, he gets on stage. He's, people get on stage. Presenting oh, this 90 is 90 the one minutes. in Miami. I was at that event. And I, I ended up. And I love Russell, but I actually like walked away during this pitch because I'm like, I was doing sales. Dude, this is too much. But anyway, you need a framework to be able to do print. Yeah, yeah, I was at that event. So I signed up to this and people would just come, well, from what I saw, people were rushing to the back, but the the video, the title of it was, and I typed three million dollars in 90 minutes or something. Yeah. 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 And that's where this idea of, you know, the the, the stories and the flow and how to position it and uh, do the stack at the end and all these types of things. I just thought, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And he's fast speaking, but... The what he what I really like about him, and he's the same as one of my other heroes, really, is uh, Zig Ziglar, who is a motivational Mm -hmm. sales speaker. The values match, you know, they're just good people, good, honest, wholesome people, and that's what kind of really resonates me with that. Yeah, and it's it's something that I think is is a, a vital part of anybody's brand is like goes back to what we've been talking about, man. People have to know you, like you, and trust you. Mm. Um, and if they don't, you know, like they're not going to see that. You know, somebody who was a speaker at that same at that same Grant Cardone event um, was uh, John Maxwell. Okay. And I think John Maxwell is one of the best speakers if anybody gets a chance to see. He starts out the talk with, you know, I'm your friend, John. And you really feel like you're his friend, John. Yeah. Like he's just cool. He's there to hang out with you and teach you. Um, and, and I think when you can really kind of create that with rapport with people, man, it's, it's really something that can help you move forward. 
that's it. And, and I always say, like, you can say what you want, but it's, it's how you make people feel. And that, that is the most important yeah. thing. And you can have the best sales man. pitch. Yeah, the best sales. It, it, it goes back to the, to the, I think it's Maya Angelou that said like that, you know, people aren't going to remember the, the things you said, but they're going to remember how you made them feel. It's, it's, I've kind of butchered that quote, but it's the idea yeah. of like, you know, making people are going to remember you for, for how you made them feel. And, and I think that's really important. Yeah. And that, that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. And I just like one with, with my training course, I focus quite a bit on emotional intelligence um, and I'm not an expert at it, but there's, there's the basis of it. But I think people, they just miss that part of it. And it's such a huge part if you want to develop and have people champion you and support you. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, when you've reached out to people or you've, you've built your career, they've thought, you know, Jeremy, I can connect with this person. And it's on that emotional intelligence level. Oh, yeah. sorry. I was muted. Um, no, yeah. it's, I, I, I agree, man. Like, because, you know, this goes back to what we've been talking about. Like it's connecting with people as a human being, you know, people aren't marketing messages. They aren't all these things we want to make them out to be. They aren't avatars. They aren't number of subscribers. They're human beings. And I think we can keep that first and foremost, man. That, that's how you really win. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, with, with your book, which is out on the 21st of June, just to remind it to yeah. everybody, um, it's, you, you've interviewed many, many people over the time that you've been doing this. And you probably always get this type of question. Hey, what well, was the number one thing that you've taken from all of this? But I just, yeah. you know, if, if you can touch on a few things that have really. Well, it's yeah. That, a few <laughs> concepts like would be kind of the, the concepts of the book, really. And that's, you know, adversity is key. Mm. You know, like if you can see adversity as something that's transformational and something that you run towards and everybody runs away from, you know, that that alone, everything else aside, you're going to win because other people run away from what's uncomfortable. Um, another thing I would say as well is at the same time, I think too many people are living their lives for other people that won't die for them. Um, you know, stop doing things because other people approve of them. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I think another way people really mess up is they do it where, okay, well, I'm going to do this and I don't care if I piss you off. Well, at the same time, you have to understand how to be gentle about those yeah. things, right? You have to understand somebody has their reality. You have your reality. And I think when you can look at it that way and say, okay, um, I, I get it that that's your plan for me. I get it. That's what you want to do for me. I love you. You're a great person. But at the same time, this is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And I think when you can get better at doing that, which is something I had to learn the hard way, frankly, by alienating a lot of people, you're going to win a lot more. and You're going to be doing what you actually want to do. Um, I another think another big thing to be considering as well is realizing that leadership is an active process. I think too many people think they get the title leader and they're a leader. Mm -hmm. um, but leadership is improving on yourself every single day. Um, and one of the, the big things I actually got from uh, one of the people I talk about in the book, which is uh, General David Petraeus, who's, uh, he used to run Central Command in, in Afghanistan, and then he also was the former CIA director, is the value in, in journaling. You know, journaling every single day and thinking out your thoughts on paper before you kind of act on them. I think if we can kind of get better and considering things before we do them, that's that's really what leadership looks like. Yeah, and it's uh, it's interesting because I put a post up the other day in regards to this this Elon Musk statement that's come out, and I I read a little bit. Which the which lines. one, man? There's been a bunch <laughs> of them. <laughs> uh, that's true. That's true. About if if you're not prepared to come back into work, then you can pretty much go away. Um, you don't, you don't well, he wants people that are on his team, though, at the same time, like like you, you want people that are all on board. Right. Um, and if he's saying in order for our business to run correctly, you got to be in the office. You got to be in the office like he wants to, He wants people that are on his team. If he doesn't, there's there's other people that probably want to be on his team. There's definitely someone that would take their place without a doubt. But the, the, the bit that stood out to me was that in regards to him being in the office and him working all those hours and people seeing that. Mm hmm. And him leading by example, like, hey, I'm yep. here, I'm putting in the work, I'm here to, I, I'm understanding what you're going through, let's all chip in, let's all do this together. Mm -hmm. And when I've uh, led teams or, or been promoted or, or asked to look after people, I've always made sure that I was willing to do stuff that I'm asking them to do. Yeah. And that's, that's vital, man. That's, that's, that's the art of war personified. If you mm -hmm. ever read uh, Sun Tzu's art of war is, you know, a leader should not ask other people to do things that they're not willing to do themselves. And I think Elon Musk is a great example of that because you see he's, he's 
in the office long hours trying to figure out a technical problem. Like he's not asking people to do something he wouldn't do himself. And I think as a leader, when you can focus on that, you're going to create less animosity and you're going to create more people that are excited about what you're doing. Yeah, I'm a little bit worried about the future here in regards to people working from home. And um, I think you can work from home. There's no doubt about it. But you need, like, especially in regards to sales, okay, so much I learned from being in the office and hearing somebody on the phone and thinking, oh, I like that. Let me try that out. Mm-hmm. And you, you just can't get that unless you're with people and around them and working with people and, you know, bouncing ideas off and having that, that water cooler um, discussion during the day, which people speak about. Well, I, I think at the same time, we're, we're kind of in this big change and, you know, even hiring. Um, like I know for us, like right now, um, our, our team's growing. Mm. And in order to hire people, I'd have to go through 100 resumes to hire two people. Mm. Um, I've been through a 1000 resumes, which I've never had to do before to hire one person. So I think at the same time, we're kind of seeing this big disruption in the work world. And, and, I, and I think within the next few years, it'll kind of shake out and we'll kind of know what that looks like. But we are in a huge disruption in how we work, what matters to people at work. Um, so I think at the same time, though we love some of those things, we're going to have to figure out how to make it work in a little bit of a different way. What are you looking for in the people that you're, you're hiring at the moment? Are there any key parts that you, you look for? Um, frankly, people <laughs> just with credentials. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's because, because okay, I, I don't mean it that way. I mean, like, because like what we're getting now is I'm getting people applying for the job that aren't even qualified and mm-hmm. getting those in the hundreds, right? Which is, which is interesting. That's not something I got before. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's because of how the work world's changed. A lot of those kind of people that aren't as skilled workers are the ones getting cut. So they're the ones looking for work right now. And a lot of the skilled workers are still, you know, still working at companies. Um, so I think that's part of what kind of what we're seeing at the same time. Um, but for me, I'm looking for somebody with a PR background. I'm looking for somebody that has experience. I'm looking for somebody that wants to be part of a team. I'm looking for somebody that's, you know, they're kind of willing to work way too hard um, because I would do that. And I expect the same thing of the people on my team, um, because I think when you have that, it creates more camaraderie. And that's a lot of what we have. And, you know, to bring somebody onto my team, I want them to have that. So if anyone wants to be on your team, where should they apply? <laughs> we're on it. We're on Indeed right now, man. If they want to find yeah. us over there, we, we've we've. We, we've just had our, 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 our best month of revenue, uh, second best month of revenue ever last month. So it's just kind of, you know, we're hiring, we're growing the team and, um, you know, th- things are going the right direction. So it's time to hire. It's great to hear because there's, although there's a lot of areas which are doing so well, even during this doom and gloom, there's a lot yeah. of places which are literally on their ass. Uh, so it's always that's the to tough part, man, because it's been so it's been. I was talking, I was did a live stream with somebody last night and I said, like, I think one of the toughest things right now is there's so many businesses that have been hit so hard because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I really feel for them because it's been really difficult. But at the same time, because my company was always online and we've been based online, like these have been our best years of business. And that's the really tough part is I know how hard they've been for other people, but they've been so good for us. Or you were already there. You were already in place. So many people have had to, like I was doing. But there's certain businesses you can't do online, right? Like, so like at the same time, it becomes really hard for them and stays really hard for them. Like you look at like, you know, manufacturing, you look at uh, um, like even the industry of like, um, you know, like the industry of taking animals from the farm, butchering them and bringing them into into stores that can't Mm. be done online. Like that has to be physically done, but they're really struggling right now with regulations changing, with people not willing to do that work. So like, it's become really hard for a lot of his, a lot of businesses, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's the reality that we're in really. And, and just when you think that things are getting better and then all of a sudden, I, I, I don't like to talk negativity. People can watch the news for that, but uh, <laughs> uh, we don't watch the news, man. We don't, exactly. You'll be better. You'll be, you'll be better avoiding it. Exactly. Yeah. And look, bad news sells, doesn't it? So why are they going to, why are they going to publish good things going on in the world? Yeah. Oh, if, if you do something highly illegal, they'll be very quick to put you on TV. So you yeah. know, if you want to get on that way, man, go for it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unfortunately, we, we probably should do a disclaimer there because we don't promote that anybody should go. And on we don't want things. people to do yeah. things highly <laughs> legal. I'm it. just saying like the media doesn't look for positivity. And I think that's why it's so important as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, as somebody with a mission. It's really important to be proactive in getting your own message out there because the, the media isn't looking for it. So you no. have to be willing to put it out there. Like if you do something wrong, they're very quickly going to pick up on that. 
and the thing is, although it's still hard to get eyeballs to see you, it's never been an, a, a better time or easier time to record something, press click, and it's out to the world. Now, there's obviously yep. little tricks you can do and hashtags and all these types of things, but if it's popular or it's opinionated or it goes against the curve a little bit, people are going to start to view these types of things, and, and you never know, they might get some traction with it. 100%, man, 100%. Mm. Yeah. So is there anything within the book that we haven't mentioned that you feel that the audience should really know about? There's going to be some key parts for them to check it out when it's out next week on Tuesday. Yeah, on Tuesday, I think we've, we've actually, this is one of the, the, the more enjoyable conversations I've actually had around it, man. So I, I appreciate that from you. Um, and I think we've really covered a lot of the core messages for us. I would just encourage people um, to go out and grab it, man. Um, there's, there's a lot of great information here. And I, I, what my, my goal was to take out all the, the, the BS that people always tell you about what it takes to success, be successful mm -hmm. um, and show you it's about hard work. It's about integrity. It's about knowing what you're all about. And it's about willing to work things through. Um, and that's a lot of what I'm trying to show people in these stories. Yeah, I like what you put that um, it could have been over. It could have been a thousand pages, you know, but uh, you want. You want I, I didn't want to write a thousand pages either. So that, that's part of the issue. Yeah. <laughs> could have done font size 20. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It'd be a thousand pages then. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because I'm, I'm trying to, I'd love to kind of put a book together at some point and I've got a couple of ideas um, in regards to what I want to do. I've got quite a crazy personal life story, um, which I hopefully look to put down and I, I reckon it could be a movie at some point as well. So uh, <laughs> not, not what I've been through, but what I've experienced in my life as well. Yeah. So, uh, but the thing is, What's interesting, everyone's kind of got a story at the moment and everyone starts with like the pain they've been through and how they've been able to get through it and how they've been able to survive and make things happen. And it's, it's interesting, people will be like, hey, you haven't got problems, what about the starving people in Africa? And I feel for them, trust me, I feel for them, okay? But it's all relative. You could be having a bad day where it's just simple that you've got bad feedback from your boss. Okay. Well, that, that's one of the things I wrote about, man. Like if you look at adversity, right, there's no quality of it. There's no quantity of it. The only way you know it exists is by experiencing it. And I think it's yeah. really hard to say, well, yours is harder than mine. And that's exactly it. And I just think people get shut down too much because, I mean, there, there's this whole thing about um, duveting people now, like cuddling people too much these days. But I think there is a balance. Like people should be vocal, should be, should be able to voice that they've got a problem and they should be able to speak. They should feel comfortable to speak to people. But then they also need to get on with it because this imposter syndrome, which we spoke about at the beginning, the doubt, the worry, I can't succeed, I can't do this. It's amazing what difference mm -hmm. it makes when you've actually done it and you realize you've been able to do it. Exactly. No, I, yeah. I would agree 100%, man. Great. Well, look, Jeremy, one of the reasons why I got you on the podcast here was because when I saw what you were doing and what you're about and who you're about, I saw some connection. Like, I'm not saying I, I, I dismiss thousands of people each day on my podcast, but there has to be some connection there. And I hope that's how you've been able to feel that the book's been covered and we've been able to speak about things going on in the book. Yeah. Because, because what, what you're doing and what you're talking about I relate to it, and that's the message I try to put out as well. So I um, really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for being on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me, man. Yeah. This is, it's, been a, it's been a really awesome conversation. Great. All right. Well, if you're ever over in, ever coming to Dubai, uh, hopefully you'll be able to meet up. Any yeah, plans? Uh, um, I don't know, man. <laughs> we, did, we finally just started traveling again. We were just in Mexico uh, a couple of weeks ago. Nice. Um, but I'm hoping to get back to Europe this summer. So I know Dubai is a little bit more of a, a hop, skip and a jump from there. So, so I guess we'll see. Yeah. It's amazing in regards to how people love the sort of motivational stuff and inspiring stuff. And if, if it can be positioned the right sort of way, like the other week, uh, Lewis Howes was here, uh, ended up getting to meet him, which was amazing. Um, and it was quite interesting because he got up on stage and he spoke. He literally just said to these people in the crowd, it was a real estate event. He was brought in to kind of inspire people, these real estate agents. And he pretty much said, look, none of you care for my story. Like none of you care for who I'm about. I can tell this, you're on your phone. You're not giving a shit who cares. Like, but I'm going to tell you this now. And it, it was quite interesting because he speaks about hard times, 
Um, but there's people in the Middle East, which are from Syria, from Lebanon, from all these war-torn countries, which have come to Dubai. Yeah. They, they've for, had some harder times than many more of us can imagine. This is it. And I felt when, even though Lewis was getting upset about it, I could see that he kind of gone, oh, sod this, but they've been through so many hard times and he's, he's got some stories and there's some traumatic stories, but these guys can top so many of it. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was interesting, but there's, there's great opportunity over here. And I highly recommend people to come here if they're open-minded about helping and developing people, which I know and I feel that you are Jeremy. So you're welcome yeah. at any time. <laughs> cool, man. I appreciate it. Great. All right. Well, Jeremy, thank you very much for your time. Uh, do you want to tell, let everybody know where they can connect with you or tell us a bit more about the book, like where they can get it yeah. from? Please. Yeah. Yeah. They can connect with me on all platforms. I'm at Jeremy Ryan Slate everywhere. Um, and also if they want to grab the book, it's over at getextraordinarybook.com. And uh, if they head over there and uh, come back with their order code or their order number um, and, and, you know, pop that in the, the box, we're going to give them a free version of the audio book as well as our audio guide of 30 days to extraordinary. So that's getextraordinarybook.com. Brilliant. Okay. Lovely. Okay. So uh, I will put all that in the bio as well. Uh, there'll be everything mentioned. And I'm going to listen back over to this again. I'm going to take note of the books that you mentioned. I'll put that in there. And, um, you know, thank you for sharing your ideas and your opinions. And uh, I'll catch up with you soon. Hey, thanks for having me, man. This is great. Thanks, Jeremy. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for listening and watching, guys. I hope there were some real gems that you get inspired by and take action with. Within the description, I tried to mention everything that's been spoken about, but on a daily basis, I put out content to inspire and help others. To see more, please like, subscribe, and follow me on Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcast. Search by the name Mark Sclair. Thank you very much again, and I hope you enjoy the journey.